Hello and welcome to the European Report. Here we are in the European Parliament, here in the heart of uh, Brussels, to discuss what really is a review of 2012. We'll be discussing some of the key major events that have taken place in this continent, in Europe, and also in the Middle East. And we'll also be asking, what does 2013 hold uh, for the European Union? and what does it hold for Israel and the Middle East. I'm joined by Thomas Sandel again from uh, the European Coalition for Israel and from Andrew Tucker from Christians uh, for Israel in Holland and Eli Nanandav Heyman, uh, who is the director of, uh, sorry, European Friends of Israel. So gentlemen, welcome to the programme. Um, I'll first start off with, uh, with you, Thomas. Um, what do you believe are the most significant events that have had an impact on Israel and the Middle East to happen in 2012? Well, I, I would have to say that there, there, there have been several events, and I, and I think it would be unfair to just point out one, one particular. Um, of course, I think what people expected in 2012 was perhaps that there would be something decisive happening with regards to Iran. This did not happen. So perhaps the most significant ev event is a non-event. The fact that we are still, you know, uh, we, we, we have avoided this, uh, this showdown. Uh, the sanctions have been stepped up. But as far as, uh, as uh, confrontation between, between Israel and Iran, this has not happened. And I said, uh, you know, thank, thank God that this is the case. Um, so, of course, I could easily then mention events which are also of, of high importance, but I, you know, in retrospect, I would go back and say, well, the most significant event of 2012 was a non-event. And uh, Eli Nadav, uh, what, what was your, do you believe, is the key event that's really taken place in 2012 that could have repercussions for 2013? I think the main event, not only an event, if you want to call it an earthquake, uh, was the, the Arab Spring, uh, not only the beginning of it, but the fact that it really continued and it keeps happening today as we speak in, uh, in Syria. Uh, in Egypt now we already see the, the aftershock. Um, so for me the Arab Spring is the, is the most you know, heavy event uh, of 2012 with regard to the Middle East, Israel and Europe. And, uh, and Andrew, what would you say that you believe is the most significant event that's taken place well, during 2012? I think from my perspective, um, perhaps it's not been the most uh, highly profiled, but it is the, uh, I think, the stagnation of the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians and the application of the Palestinians at the UN for recognition uh, as a state. Uh, and that's on the table at the moment. Um, so I, I think that's a fundamental issue, which to my mind has been a little bit undervalued, but could have huge repercussions for the whole situation in the region. Yeah. So, um, Eliandav, let, let's talk about the Arab Spring, because in 2001, we really saw the revolution, which was known as the Arab Spring. It, it, it promised democracy, reform, and liberty to North Africa and the Arab world. And yet what we've seen is turned into the Arab winter with dangerous Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Salafist parties coming to power in Tunisia, coming to power and particularly in Egypt as well, which is considered the leader of the Arab world. We're seeing the aftermath of this in Jordan with the Muslim Brotherhood gaining more power um, and traction against the um, regime of uh, the Hashemite kingdom of Gordon, um, King Abdullah, and also the uh, civil war that's breaking out in Syria now. What are the implications, if the West doesn't get to grips with this, be for the future of the Middle East? Well, it's, you know, it's a, a bit of a philosophical question, because the West always, the, the West always asks for democracy, the, the West always preaches for democracy, and for the first time you had, you, you can say what you want about the, the Arab Spring, but you had free elections in, uh, in Egypt and, and in Tunisia. The fact that there was Islamic parties that rose to power, with, you see, Egypt, they have more than, almost 80% of the parliament is either uh, Muslim Brethren or the, or, the, or the Salafis. Then you ask yourself, okay, well, maybe, maybe the West has to step back for a second and ask itself, did we do right when we preached for, for democracy in the Arab world, knowing that it would be the outcome? I mean, what did we think in Europe that, you know, there will be free elections and Mubarak will be re-elected democratically? Obviously not. So, 
you know, maybe it's, it's time for the West to start thinking of other ways to engage the Arab world in the, you know, the, the, the global, the global, uh, the global <laughs> community than preaching for, I call it, blind democracy. So you, you see this, you see the, the total disaster that it created in, in Syria. Uh, you know, Jordan is trembling, Lebanon is maybe the next in line. So I think, I think Europeans and Americans and all the Western cultures have to take a step back and say, okay, let's not intervene in this, see what happens. I mean, they can't intervene. Uh, so for me, that's the... Uh, and Thomas, really, isn't this a, a, a misnomer, particularly the State Department, also the um, EU's policy towards uh, the Arab world, and also I'd declare that as well with the British Foreign Office. There's this focus on democracy, focus on getting uh, people to vote in the ballot box, but you need to build the democratic institutions of a state before you can actually have a functioning democracy. Uh, is this something that some of our European leaders have probably been very short-sighted on? Absolutely. I think the European Union has failed not only once but twice. You know, if we look back only two, three years ago, we would have Gaddafi walking around in this parliament. There would be the red carpet. Everyone would be happy to be in a photo opportunity. All of a sudden, he's person non grata. And you say, well, I never heard of this guy. You know, he's, he's, he's a disaster. How can it be that things change overnight? And now again, then they thought, well, we have to, you know, do it right this time. And they failed again, as uh, Elina Dav said, you know, just saying, well, democracy, democracy, democracy. Well, what is democracy? I think on, on one point, I would uh, probably disagree with Elina Dav, and that is that um, I believe that the European Union and the West need to stay engaged. But they need to stay engaged with a different strategy than before. It needs to be much more uh, developed than... To, to quote George W. Bush, who said, well, once I come into the Baghdad, people will be there to greet me, you know, like a messiah. It didn't happen. And it won't happen in Cairo. It won't happen in these countries. But we have an obligation still to identify the good people, the good elements in their societies. And we know that they are there. People of, of uh, uh, with a liberal mindset, with, with um, uh, subscribing to universal values, wanting really to, ch to see a change. Uh, it's impossible for me to say, well, how many are they, how well organized are they? But I believe, for, in particular for the European Union, we need to, to help build democracy by equipping the, the right people. And, and uh, this cannot be done only militarily. We have to, to uh, undertake a, a, a huge educational process. And only then can we hope for uh, democratic societies. Mm. And really, um, Andrew, the, the revolution in which we've seen with the Arab Spring has um, huge implications for, for Christians, has huge implications for moderate Muslims and liberal reformers who are, are suffering under the rise of Islamism across the Arab world. Uh, isn't it time that the West, and particularly Christians across Europe, stood up for their fellow brethren who are, who are suffering persecution in the Arab world right now? Oh, I think so. Um, you, you're definitely seeing, I mean, we're, we're seeing, I think, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we're seeing incidents of persecution of Christians in, in all the Islamic countries, not only, of course, in the Middle East. We're seeing it in Nigeria and throughout, uh, throughout Africa. Um, so definitely it's time to be sticking up for, uh, for the Christians who are persecuted. Let's not forget as well that... Um, uh, it was the Jews first. Okay, we're seeing persecution of the Christians now, but we've gone through 50 or 100 years where it was the Jews who've been driven out of these countries. And the Christians, you always see that throughout history. It's the Christians who uh, are being persecuted. It's not so much persecution of Christians as such, but in my view, rejection of everything that is Judeo-Christian, and particularly the rejection of the God of... The Jewish people. Um, so there's a fundamental issue. I, it's very easy to get onto the bandwagon, I think, of you know, standing up for the, the persecuted church. Of course we must do that. But I think more fundamentally, and I think this is what Ellie is getting to and Thomas as well, there's a fundamental hatred, if I can use that word, 
of everything that involves um, the, the God of Israel. If we talk about democracy, then true democracy, um, at least a, a long living democracy, comes from Judeo roots. Um, and, and to my mind, that's the fundamental issue. Islam will not accept the existence of anybody in their regions who believes in the one God of Israel. What does the Arab Spring, particularly what's happening in Egypt now, uh, certainly a lot of tension between the Israeli-Egyptian border, uh, we've seen an escalation in terrorist attacks from Gaza, and also the situation with the uh, Syrian border is also looking a bit... Um, a bit uh, dangerous and precarious. Uh, what are the security implications with the rise of Islamic extremism in the Arab world have for Israel's security? In terms of security, I think Israel is now preparing itself, you know, hoping for the best, preparing for the, for the worst. Um, I don't see a, a situation where uh, we, we'll pass from a, from a cold war to a warm war, with, uh, to a real war with, with Egypt. Uh, too much, too much is uh, too much is on the table for the Egyptians, and it's it's they won't take that chance. Financially, uh, world politics-wise, etc. But the fact that uh, that it's a Muslim government in Egypt is is they they try to to do the arbitrage between Israel and the Palestinian now to get to a ceasefire in Gaza. Their declaration was that that Israel has caused this problem and Israel is the aggressor where for every 10 or 20 missiles that they fire from Gaza, Israel is retaliating. So they are not an honest broker, absolutely not. And take it a bit to the north, on the, on the Syrian side, I don't think it's the intention of the Syrian government to escalate. Uh, they have enough problems as it is with their own civil war. Obviously, it's not in Israel's interest to escalate the, the war, but as uh, mortars were fired from the Syrian side to the Israeli side, Israel had to react. It's, it's not only her right, but it's her, it's her uh, obligation as a sovereign country that was attacked. Um, but from what I understood, um, the Israelis said to the UN, look, we, are, we have no interest in es escalating, and the Syrians did the same. So there was two mortars, two tank shells, and I hope that this is finished for now. Mm. Uh, we got a clip to go to now that looks at this uh, situation. We're now joined by uh, Charlotte Gutman, who is the uh, deputy leader here of the Jewish community in Brussels. Uh, it's great to be joining you uh, again, uh, Charlotte. Um, we're here for the ECI conference, which is really designed to generate support and encouragement for Israel and the Jewish people. How important do you feel it's for Christians to get behind the Jewish community here in Brussels and across Europe? I think it's very important and very crucial today. That's why as the president of ORT in Belgium, an NGO, non-sectarian NGO in education and vocational training, I decided to take a stand at the Festival of Peace that was organized by Jews and Christians together. And it was an amazing day of uh, uh, gospel atmosphere and Israeli dances and songs and it was uh, beautiful to see this uh, strong relationship that we have as Judeo-Christian area that we live in. So I am a big fan of this uh, cooperation and I think uh, dramatically today we need it as Jewish people and to protect Israel in a way also. Uh, and what do you um, think of the current situation Israel f finds itself in today? I mean, three Israelis have been killed by uh, Hamas rockets and missiles fired from Gaza. Um, what do you make of the current situation? Well, you know, my subject are the misleading words. And so we have to observe provocation on one side and on the other side a response once you cannot refrain from giving a response because it's out of limit. 120 rockets were sent yesterday in a day from Gaza to Israeli cities. So I did ask the representative of, Ms. of Lady Ashton now, how many rockets need to be sent 
on Israeli cities to justify an official reaction by the EU. I'm sure that if there would be one rocket sent here, inside uh, Belgium, from one city to the other, there would never be a second one. Uh, and why do you think we haven't got a reaction from the European Union um, in, in response to this uh, barrage of rockets attacks have been fired on vulnerable Jewish communities in southern Israel? Why? I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what they are waiting for, uh, but uh, it's very scary to see the lack of reaction because it looks like, and the Israelis also feel like that, is that it's, it's a unique case in the world. Only with this little territory will there be such a behavior towards Israelis and uh, their citizens, and the lack of respect, in a way, for what they are, normal civilians. And the provocation that leads into responses are misleading, in a way, because the press will report about it like victims on one side, the provokers, and aggressors on the other side, just the ones who cannot refrain from reacting any longer and who are considered as aggressors and are trying to defend, defend their citizens and their territory. I mean, when we've seen uh, probably mainstream media reporting on the current incident that's taking place in Israel, and particularly Israel's conflict with, with Hamas, um, sadly it's only become a news story now that the Israelis have actually retaliated uh, to the barrage of missile attacks. Um, do you think there is a danger in misleading uh, reporting and coverage of this conflict that can actually escalate and lead to a rise of anti-Semitism across Europe? It's linked, huh? It has been linked uh, for years and it will be linked uh, for uh, the future as well. And we have to live with it. Uh, we cannot say what's going to be, but for sure it's linked. Charlotte Gutman, thank you for joining us today. We're now joined by Rea Kalanova, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the European Jewish Congress. You attended this very important, significant conference organised by the European Coalition for Israel and you talk, talk, spoke very powerfully about the rise of anti-Semitism and the fear within the Jewish communities here in Brussels. How real is that fear of anti-Semitism in Europe? As I explained today, what is happening now with the rise of anti-Semitism, so many years after the end of the Second World War, it is really uh, sad but it is a fact and the fact is as I explained today during the conference is it normal for a citizen of one of the most progressive democratic European country as Belgium to to be to go to, around the city freely and not to be able to to enter a Jewish school or a synagogue without being checked, without uh, seeing all these people heavily armed, police, cameras. We only one minority, Jewish minority in Europe, that experience this kind of feeling. You can go to a church, you can go to university, to a Catholic school, whatever, without any fear and without any security. Because that means all this heavy security around Jewish institutions, that means that governments take this seriously, that they know that there is a danger. And we have to protect our kids that ask us why other kids are not protected. Why around our schools there are all these heavy armed soldiers? And I think that we cannot sleep quietly until this phenomenon doesn't stop. We would also like to enter our Jewish institutions without fear. Absolutely. And how do you feel here attending this conference knowing there are so many Christians that are standing in solidarity with Israel and the Jewish people across Europe at this time? Uh, I told already today to Thomas Sandel when I thanked him for inviting me, I had such a wonderful feeling today, you know, I came here tired, sad, uh, had some difficult uh, uh, encounters today and I felt like a wave of positive energy just around me, of so many friends looking at me with friendly eyes and I, I, I thought to myself, we will overcome, it will be okay because we have so many wonderful friends in the Christian community of Europe and all around the world that we will overcome because I met people who realize that the problems that Jews feel 
are problems of all democratic countries, of all democratic populations, that all the problems in history very often began with Jews, but after other populations suffered, and maybe even more. During the war, we had know that six million Jews perished, but how many non-Jews perished? Much more. The figures are powerful and talk for themselves. Tens of millions perished, and that is why this solidarity and this comprehension of the problems, it was, I had a wonderful feeling today, and I have no words to thank all our Christian friends for, for this solidarity and for this friendship. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, so I just want to bring in another issue. Um, that it, it's related to this, and it's a bit closer to home, and that is the issue of uh, Europe. Do you believe that we've seen an increase or a return of anti-Semitism to the continent of Europe, particularly because in March we had that horrendous attack in Toulouse on the Jewish school? We've seen uh, Jewish communities in France, also in Belgium, and in Hungary, and in, uh, in Sweden, actually very fearful. Um, because of an escalation in anti-Semitism? Well, well I, I would say if you asked me that question in, in uh, 2003, I would probably said yes already then. And uh, so not in particular looking at 2012. I don't think 2012 will go down as the year when anti-Semitism uh, had a major um, uprise in, in Europe. But gradually, of course, over the last uh, 10 years, we have seen an escalation and uh, of course, the reason I say 2003 is, is perhaps that um, um, that was the, around the time of the Second Intifada. That was the time where uh, a survey in Europe asking the question which nation poses the biggest threat to world peace in the world. And, and when they came to the conclusion that this was Israel. Um, and so I think 2003 is probably more of a marker looking back and saying, well, uh, since 2003, there has been an escalation. Um, to be fair, 2012, we had a number of instances, but you have to look at it in a, in a bigger, bigger picture. In that big picture, I would also say that anti-Semitism in Europe, of course, has always been there in, in, in different shapes and forms. What happened, many experts would say what happened after the Second World War was that there was a um, period which was quite unique in European history because there was hardly no anti-Semitism. But this was more the exception uh, than, than, than the rule. And the rule is, sadly, that Europe as a continent is connected with, with a lot of Jew hatred and, and a lot of anti-Semitism. And, and we do see, looking back the, the last 10 years, we do see a, a rise of anti-Semitism. Mm. And if, Andrew, if we take your uh, host country for a moment, uh, mm. the Netherlands. Now, we've seen in the Netherlands a reaction really to the rise of Islamic extremism in Holland and in Europe, and in particular when it comes to uh, kosher food and the issue of circumcision, uh, which is to stop the spread of Islamicization happening in Holland, but this is also having implications for the Jewish community as well. Uh, can you say really how the Jewish community is being affected in Holland through these proposed legislations? Well, just to pick up on that point, we, we did have that incident uh, this last year where uh, we have a, a small party in Holland that's called the Party for Animals, and they put up this proposal which was against, um, a, against uh, the, the slaughter of, of, of animals. So it wasn't done from the perspective of uh, being directed against uh, Islam at all. It was done very much from a humanitarian perspective. And I think that's very significant because that's very, very typical of Dutch society, but it's also typical, I think, throughout Europe. Uh, we're seeing, I think, really definitely a rise of fundamental Islam, that's for sure. But at the same time, perhaps even stronger, the rise of humanitarian, secular uh, thinking. And to me, that was, that's really the driving force behind a lot of these uh, initiatives. And also behind, I think, the way that uh, people are looking at Israel and the Jewish people as a whole. Uh, we now have a new government in the Netherlands. Uh, we had a very, very strong government in the Netherlands, very supportive of Israel. And now we have a coalition made up of liberals and the Labour Party. 
Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see in the coming periods how they deal with, uh, with Israel. They're going to take a very different perspective. Yeah, Anneli Nadav, um, as an Israeli, I mean, uh, you've got a state behind you, you've, you've had your military background. I know there's a difference between how Israelis feel and how, say, a, a Jewish person here in Europe would actually feel an issue of anti-Semitism. Um, but have you heard reports uh, in Europe about uh, raising levels of fear and concern that there's been an escalation in attacks on the Jewish community. We also saw that hideous terrorist attack on Israeli tourists in Bulgaria in the summer of 2012. Um, what was your interpretation in terms of the threat that Israelis face from terrorism in Europe? Um, well, you, th you took us to, uh, to Bulgaria. Uh, I just wanted to say a, a, a little thing about, uh, about the anti-Semitism um, from my point of view. There's no doubt that there is a raise in, in anti-Semitism, uh, uh, in anti-Semitic uh, incidents. You have, I checked, you have about 70% uh, rise in the last three years compared to the three years before. But in my opinion, this is an export of, or if you want from a European point of view, an import of the, of the Middle East crisis to Europe. If you break down these, uh, these anti-Semitic incidents, it would be 90% of the time would be Muslim immigrants attacking Jewish targets or individuals. So what worries me much more than the list, of course it's worrying and it's a problem that has to be dealt. But from a larger uh, uh, point of view, the thing that is more worrying is things like the rise of the Golden Dawn Party in, in Greece, which is right-wing, if you want, old-school European anti-Semitism anti -Semitism that you know, gets power in the polls. This is, for me, much more worrying than a few incidents a year caused by Muslim immigrants toward the Jewish population. Don't get me wrong, it's wrong, it's, it's, it's worrying, but for me, it's the, when you look at the bigger picture, this is much more of a problem. And, and Thomas, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to, to join that debate on anti-Semitism because it's so complex. It, it, exactly as, as you said, you have on the one hand uh, traditional right-wing anti-Semitism, you have new forms of extreme Islamist anti-Semitism. I would like to add to, to, to that picture something which I would actually consider the most dangerous form of all, which I would call sophisticated humanistic anti-Semitism. And, and um, uh, which, which has always been there in European society, often in, in very high levels in, in society in terms of education, sophistication. And you, you have to remember that many of the leading Nazis, you know, they were not crazy people. You know, they, they, they were listening to Wagner, you know, they were reading Goethe, you know, they were sophisticated people. So, so what we see today, I, I, I will... Re I, I will um, not trying to define it politically because that, that you know, won't serve the cause, but we have an educated class, sophisticated class, who, whose view on, in particular, the state of Israel is very similar to the view that the sophisticated, uh, educated class had in the 30s and the 40s of Jewish people as a whole. And you have this incident, it was a number of years ago, off the record, a French diplomat who spoke about Israel, had, excuse me, my language, that shitty little country, which, which in a nutshell gives an insight into how our political elite, part, I should say, part of our political elite is, is looking at the whole issue of Israel and the Jewish community. And you have this then um, toppled with humanitarian, humanistic um, um, plea for, for human rights. As an example, many Christian aid organizations, you know, they, they're, they're not the radical Muslims, they're not the right-wing crazy people, they're not left-wing. Still, they come to the same conclusions often in singling out Israel as the only sort of source of problem in the world. So for me, it's, it's a, it's my, it's, I'm fascinated by the complexity of this whole issue. But my point is really to say that, from my point of view, this is for me what makes, you know, uh, it, it's giving me headache even more, as you say, the, you know, the Islamists uh, on, on the street, the right-wing crazy people. I can understand them. And I think it's easy for people of, of, of um, goodwill to understand this is bad, this is bad. I think it's more difficult when you see someone who reminds 
uh, you of, of, of yourself. And you say, well, I can relate to this person. He's educated, he's, he's well articulated, but still he comes to the same conclusions. Yeah. If, if I could just pick up, I would agree with Thomas. I, I think there's a whole trend of, uh, of what you might even call Christian anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Sure. Which really, I think, is very concerning, yeah. uh, not only in Europe, but throughout the Western world. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems very reasonable, doesn't it? It yeah. seems very, very um, worldly and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. But you have the main church institutions mm -hmm. coming out with anti-Israel statements yeah. time and time again. And um, they're doing it on the basis of human rights. Uh, so instead of standing up for the Jewish people, instead of standing up for the rights of the Jewish people to have a secure homeland in the midst of um, a very unstable region, they're coming out with anti Israel statements, which um, it's good and it's right to criticize Israel and Jewish people from time to time. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Israel's not perfect. We're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But when you challenge the very right of the Jewish people to live as a nation in the Middle East, you're getting to a very, very serious point, which I think undermines your legitimacy even as a church to make any statement whatsoever. So just a short, short thing on this, but I think we, should, we need to be very, very careful not to mix um, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism because, I, in my opinion, it makes, you know, it's the, the, the word anti-Semitism anti became very cheap. You know, we use it very easily. And I think uh, we really have to make sure that we don't call any person who is uh, uh, criticizing Israel automatically to label him as an anti-Semite because this is uh, uh, something that will hurt the war anti-Semitism on the long run. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But w wouldn't you agree with me here that I had a, a, a good friend who was high up in the uh, US uh, Department of Defense in the Pentagon and uh, <clears throat> I met him in uh, 1999 and the one thing he said to me which, which still has an impact on me today and he says that the Jewish people are, are like the uh, canary that goes down the mine shaft and once something happens to the canary with the poisonous gases and they die that sends a warning signal to the rest of the miners to get out because there are dangerous gases in the mine. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with me today that the Jewish people are the warning signal for, for society and what we're seeing really is an escalation in anti-Semitism and attitudes and hatred towards the Jewish people is a warning to our own civilization that's in trouble here in Western Europe. I'll let either of you answer that. Um, I <laughs> <laughs> if, if I would take it a slightly different way and come back to, to your, your um, remark, which, which I agree with, of course, and, and um, I think we all agree to say that, you know, there's no, when does anti-Israelism go over to anti-Semitism, when is it legitimate criticism? I think what we are all trying to say that, of course, you should be able to criticize Israel uh, as any other state. But when you look at the, um, the new definitions of anti-Semitism, it's not only to say, well, anti-Semitism is once you, you know, go out and, and beat up a Jew on the street. Yeah. Anti-Semitism is something much more today. And, and, in the, um, and these are EU uh, definitions, by the way. It, it does say, for example, that once you um, <clears throat> dispro disproportionate criticism of the Jewish state is, is uh, considered anti-Semitic. So if you only focus on one state of all the 193 and say, well, they are the source of all the problems, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not legitimate criticism of Israel anymore. It's something, something else. And, and then you have, of course, take, for example, the, the, the um, what do you call them, the caricatures, you know, in, in, you, when you go back to old stereotypes of, of Jew as an individual and you, you um, focus on the state and say, well, you know, of course, you know, Israel is a bloodthirsty government, they just want to beat up the, the, the Palestinians. Of course, this is no longer just reasonable criticism of the government policy of a particular country, but something else. But, but I, agree, I agree, you know, we need to be careful and, and we should, um, you know, always be cautious of uh, calling something anti-Semitism, which is not. 
Yeah, I, I think we have to move on to, to a different issue here. Uh, and that is probably the biggest foreign policy challenge of uh, this generation, and that is the threat of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. And this is something that's been a big issue in 2012 and certainly be a big issue in 2013. Um, do you, I'll start with you, uh, uh, Elin Nadav. Um, what impact do you think President Obama's re-election will have on deterring Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, or will it not? First of all, I don't think that uh, the election of Obama will be any different than if it, uh, Romney was elected. I mean, we have to put, you know, before the elections, everybody said uh, Obama will ruin the relationship with Israel. He already have ruined the relationship with Israel. Mitt Romney is the new messiah of the relationship of Israel. You know, he will put Israel in the place where it belongs, in the, in the bosom of, of, of American uh, culture um, and an American foreign relations. It's not happening. It's not going to happen. Um, Obama is one person, but he's is not deciding on himself. You know, it's not, it's not his decisions on everything. He has the whole American culture, the whole American politics. He has the Congress, the Senate behind him. He cannot move on his own without consulting uh, his, uh, his surroundings in, in Washington, D.C. Therefore, I think anything that might happen with Iran, first of all, doesn't have anything to do with the elections. Now, I think that once Obama was elected for the second time, he knows it's his last term anyway. He cannot be re-elected again. I think he'll be much more free to act um, without, without having you know, too many thoughts about uh, what it will, everybody thinks, will I be re-elected, etc. And, and I think it will do good uh, for Israel, for the entire world who is, who is suffering from the Iranian uh, threat. And, and I believe, I don't think that you know, I, I'm not a, a, a defense minister or, a, or a general, but I don't believe that Israel or the U.S. Uh, want to attack Iran. I think it's the last thing that, that will happen. I hope we'll not get to that. Um, I think the sanctions will do, I mean, look, look now at Iran, it's, it, it's not the same country as, as a year ago. I mean, the, the, the currency, the, the Iranian real went down to something like 70 percent in less than a year the markets are empty the people are starting slowly slowly to think of going out to the streets the sanctions are there they are real they're working maybe we could you know put a little bit more pressures pressure but i think the diplomatic sanctions are working we're on the right path I just want to bring you in this one, and Thomas, been uh, news reports um, out over the last uh, few weeks in particular saying that back in 2009, President Obama wanted a full comprehensive agreement with Iran to normalise relations if they stopped their nuclear weapons programme. He, he also failed to stand up for those uh, brave and courageous demonstrators who opposed the regime in 2009 when we saw the uh, rigging of the presidential elections in Iran, which saw Ahmadinejad return to power through uh, the supreme leader of Iran, the Tol um, Tola Khomeini. Um, isn't there a great danger here, and this is one of my slight fears now, is that President Obama is re-elected. Uh, he hasn't really sought any sort of confrontation. He hasn't given clear red line and guidance regarding Iran's nuclear weapons program that he actually may not do anything to stop Iran developing nuclear weapons? Well, um, I mean, go going back, looking at his track record, you, you mentioned 2009 and the uprising in Iran, and that's something where I agree. I believe it was uh, uh, a failure of the U.S. Uh, government as a whole not to, to, to recognize what was uh, surely an Iranian uh, spring. And this was, of course, before the events then in called uh, the Arab Spring. And uh, it would be interesting, actually, to see how Obama looks at this in retrospective and say, well, would he acknowledge that he, that was a miscalculation? Uh, looking, looking at the situation today, um, I, um, I, I, I happened to listen to your defense minister two weeks ago in London, and, and he gave a very good, good speech also on the Israeli, you know, where, where the government stands right now. I think his um, perception, and I would probably share that perception, is that it, you know, Iran is not only an Israeli issue, it is a European issue, it is an American issue, it is an issue of the global community. 
uh, I don't think that, that Obama has given in. I don't think that he, he is uh, sloppy with, with Iran. Uh, I do agree that he has put a red line. He has made it clear what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. Um, I hope that, because it all has to do with the new government that he will have around him now, uh, what will be his, um, his policy for the next four years? In what way will it, may it change? My only strong point of criticism, and I said this before in this program, is to say that um, sometimes you communicate more in what you are not saying than what you are saying. And I, I, I would, if, if Obama please would listen and take my friendly advice here from the program today, I would say be careful next time that you don't give the impression to the Arab street that you are not a friend with the Israeli Prime Minister. Regardless of if you get along or not, if you like him, do invite him into the White House, make it clear to the whole community, in particular to the people in Tehran, that this is a, this is a friend, we are going to, we are sticking together in this. And, and I believe if he would take my advice, we'd be in a better place one, one year from now. Yeah. Uh, and Andrew, what, what do you make of the, this particular issue that, you know, here we are, uh, at the end of 2012, 2013, um, it's believed that Iran is now on the threshold of developing nuclear weapons, which would be a game changer in the Middle East. I believe it will lead to a proliferation of nuclear weapons in the region, making it more likely that uh, nuclear material bombs could be in the hands of t Islamic terrorist organisations like Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah that could attack Paris, London or New York. Uh, well, I'm certainly not an expert on, uh, on any of these things. But what I do know is that um, there's a spiritual dimension to, to all of this. Uh, I don't believe in doomsday scenarios. I don't believe in um, some kind of science fiction about the, an order of events. But what I do believe is that there are, uh, and I believe it's biblical, that there are uh, forces and powers going on uh, and that we are at a very, very critical moment in world history. Um, I've no idea what's going to happen with Iran and the weapon. I don't believe that Iran will use a nuclear weapon if they have it against Israel. But what you do see is um, a, co a coalition of powers developing uh, around Israel. Let's not forget Turkey. Let's not forget Russia and what's going on. Um, and I think we're going to come to the stage where, um, you know, Europe and the nations of the West are going to have to make choices. Do they stand for the existence of the State of Israel or not? And it's an ex existential, fundamental choice that they have to make. It's going to be very easy to sacrifice Israel for the sake of world peace um, with the enemies of Israel. And, and I think that's the choice that they're going to have to make. Do they fight, and I'm not advocating war, but do they prepare to fight even in the diplomatic circles? They'll have to do it when it comes to the question of, um, is the state of Israel legitimate? Do the Jewish people have a right to live in Jerusalem and in the heart of Jerusalem? They're fundamental issues which you have to make a decision on. And I believe it goes to the heart of your identity as Christian nations to stand up on behalf of the Jewish people. No, I, I agree with you very much on that, that point, Andrew. Um, and Elena Dav, uh, what are the opportunities and what are the challenges facing the uh, State of Israel 2013? So 2013 will, for Israel will open up with uh, elections. Um, on January 22nd, we have uh, elections. I say it impor it's important elections because um, it's the first elections where the main subject is not the, the, the Palestinian conflict. And uh, this time we're talking about, it's all about the economy. It's all about the social protest that we had uh, last summer and two summers ago. Uh, so it's really, it's, if you want, it's an his historical uh, election. There's, uh, very few things that uh, need to happen in order for Netanyahu not to win these elections, uh, especially with the, the new super group we created with uh, Lieberman. We see a, a major uh, shift of power toward the labor 
first time returning to his, its original numbers, uh, 22 seats, 23 seats, people even talking about more. It's the first time, according to the polls, that uh, Kadima is being erased uh, off the political map, unless there is a scenario where Eud Olmert comes back as the new leader uh, of Kadima, but he has his uh, legal issues now. It's not sure that he can run. And there's one, there's only one, basically one, only one political scenario that can change the whole map. And this is if, and don't laugh, if President Perez will come to, uh, to lead the center left. And this is, this is something that was actually taken into consideration when uh, Netanyahu and Lieberman rushed to, uh, to create this group because the political atmosphere was that Shimon Peres, this year 90 years old, will come back as the savior. And this is, this is, uh, this is the, 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 their true worry of Netanyahu and Lieberman, that Shimon Peres will come, lead the labor, Kadima, Meretz, all the, from the center and left parties as one supergroup. And for now, he's, not, he's, he's saying he's not going to do it. But the idea was there. Um, so this is the only thing that can change the, 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 the map, the political map. Uh, gentlemen, I just want to thank you so much for joining us today on the European Report. And I uh, want to thank you for watching. We've seen uh, monumentous events take place in uh, 2012. And I think we can expect uh, more uh, monumentous events to occur in 2013. So keep watching, keep praying, and thank you for watching today's European Report.